Hello everyone, Jacob here, also known as Big Yellow Praxis. I'm here with another episode about underrated music. This is a podcast where I talk with people about music that we, or maybe just I, think is underrated or overhated. So I, I, I tend to just send a playlist of music to someone and we talk about the songs. This week I am joined by my little brother. And do you want to say hello quickly? Just just a quick hello. Hi everyone. Hello. It's Zach. <laughs> Again. I, don't even get, I don't even get a name as an introduction, just your little brother. Yeah, well, you can, you, can, you can say your own name, that's fine. So this week, yeah, we are just talking about one song, and we are asking ourselves, is this song cringe or cute? Is it kind of sweet and goofy, or is it too silly to the point of shitness? So I've already done one episode uh, kind of around this theme, and it was a Mike Oldfield song called On Horseback, which I think is very, it's on the line between cringe and cute, almost perfectly. Personally, I think it's possibly a bit more cringe than cute, but it's it's right on that line. This song might be a little bit different. The song is Boogie Woogie Dance by Thin Lizzy from their 1976 album, Johnny the Fox. In France, they got a So, Zach, thoughts on this song? Okay, I'll kick it off strong. It's a piece of shit. It's re- <laughs> it feels very much like it's a song that was just written in, in about five minutes. It's got a pretty good riff. You know, I think it's one of those things where they're like, Phil Lizzie are obviously all really good musicians who all play really well together. They're really tight. So they could probably throw together something resembling a song mm-hmm. in like no time whatsoever. But just... So yeah, the the riff's good. The <clears throat> the drums are pretty good throughout. You know, there's but, a nice guitar solo. Yeah, but then the lyrics. I mean, it's called boogie woogie dance. So <laughs> there's probably not much to expect from the lyrics. Uh, yeah, and that, that's really where it falls down. I think it's. So yeah, let, let's let's take it step by step because I agree. So wait, so this <laughs> is so Thin Lizzy had just come off of their biggest album worldwide. Jailbreak, which is, you know, Boys Are Back in Town is on that. It's their only real, like, international across, you know, to US uh, hit. And that album's, like, Thin Lizzy were never huge, huge, but it was quite big. It was big enough. Um, it's big enough that, you know, they're probably all living off the royalties to that one song, Boys Are Back in Town. <laughs> <laughs> Unless most, I, I assume most of it goes to Phil Liner's estate, to be honest, because it's his songwriting credit. Yeah. Um, and then Phil Liner, once they came back from their American tour, he, he, he got hepatitis and spent some time in hospital and he wrote the songs to this album in hospital yeah, and one of the, so this album does have some good songs on it firstly but i do think generally personally do you know the album as a whole i think it's a pretty weak album it falls flat compared yeah, to so jailbreak it's got some good songs what's it got on it like johnny the fox johnny the fox Johnny. Somewhere on the waterfront, Johnny's hiding with a gun. Gold Rush is pretty good. Don't believe word is probably the best. Yeah, massacre is good at least when it's the live version. I think the yeah. album version of that song is a bit, a bit yeah. like flat. But it's, it's weird. Kind of, it's a good song. It's um, it's a weird album in that the production it, it sounds it sounds crap as an album. Yeah. Even yeah. the good song. Well, I think the the main exception is don't believe a word, which sounds you can't really fault it as a mm. song in a production. But most of it, even the good songs, are a bit like oh, it sounds a bit crap. Yeah, um, it's a weird flatness to it all. Just... Yeah, yeah. And then, so this song, Boogie Woogie Dance, it, it's no different. It sounds like it's been recorded in a cave. It's kind of like, yeah. It's got weird artificial, horrible echo on it as well, actually. Um, mm-hmm. But, we'll, you know, let's, let's get back to the groundworks, which is the positive side of it. So, 
this is uh, my, I'm okay. going to try to pitch it to you as a good song, even though I'm okay. fighting my I'm fighting my better instincts here. <laughs> um, so the drumming is cool. Like the drumming is awesome, right? Like that's some really yes, nice drumming. For sure. like, yeah. I mean, Brian Downey's drumming is always good, so it kind of goes without saying. But the drums actually sound good as well. There's like a nice stereo panning with them. They're not just a mono drums kit just kind of hitting you in the face. They're yeah, nice. Yeah. They're cool. So I, I had a thing that it might be Phil Liner on drums. Or is it just through, throughout the album? Sorry, not Phil Liner, sorry, Phil Collins. Uh, no, yeah, yeah. So this is, I think maybe he played a maraca on a song or something like that. Uh, okay, is it? He's, he's not drumming throughout. No, no, no. I think is this a lie played up by Genesis fans? <laughs> uh, I think he just, him and Phil were like friendly acquaintances and he got him to play like a maraca. I don't know, or it could be any random, like, I don't uh, know, some, okay. somewhere. So he could put him down in the credits and it, you know, Genesis were huge. Were they huge in 1976? Maybe not huge, but they were bigger than Thin Lizzy. So it probably helped. It was probably a bit of a marketing gimmick, I think. Oh, I see. Um, so it wasn't like they were helping Phil, Phil Collins out because he was having a rough patch. It's, it's like they were going to be like featuring Phil Collins on Maracas <laughs> in track three. Yeah, no, I think it's probably more the other way around where okay. <laughs> Phil Collins was helping Thin Lizzy out a little bit. Um, but I don't think anyone actually knows what he played. It's just like, yeah, he maybe played somewhere. Um, I assume the surviving members of Thin Lizzy's memories at this time are a little <laughs> yeah. hazy anyway. Um, I mean, this is a band, which, which, so this might excuse the song to some degree as well. This is a band that did a lot of drugs. <laughs> I mean, just a stupid amount. I mean, I shouldn't laugh because it's actually quite tragic. I mean, heroin addiction and everything. And then obviously Phil Line, it's inevitable. Death, 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 death in uh, 1986. Um, but then what was I saying? Oh yeah, the drumming. The drumming's cool. The guitar riff. It's a cool guitar riff. It's like mm -hmm. dark and kind of... It's a weird song that it's a bit like off-kilter rhythmically. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Is it funky? It almost is. Yeah, it's kind of like aggressively funky. At yeah. least in, once again, everything with the lyrics. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And the guitar solo? <laughs> Is very cool. It's kind of mm -hmm. like cool wah wah Brian Robertson guitar solo. Uh, um, but yeah, okay, so we have to inevitably get to the lyrics. In France, they've got a dance, a feel, a feel real crazy dance, a touch of class and a dash of romance. Feel that crazy dance. Then the chorus, boogie woogie dance, boogie woogie dance. In Spain, they give, I hate this, it's probably the worst verse. In Spain, they give it a name, a real chic cheeky name. When you know it, once you know it, you're not the same, but you really take a chance. And then the, the Brazil uh, verse is the next one. In Brazil, they got a pill, a real hard power packed pill. Take one too many, you'll feel quite ill, but you really take a chance. So, <laughs> I don't know where to start. Firstly, we'll start with the, like, the vocal melody, which is non existent, right? I, I just, yes. I don't understand. Like Phil Line, it's not necessarily the most um, melodic of songwriters, anyway, is he? Probably not. No, no like, I don't think their their vocal melodies. You know, they're not the Beatles or like Queen, where like the vocal melodies are the center of it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. He's more kind of got a cool, I don't know, Irish brogue. He, he just sounds yeah, cool. but he's, yeah, and he kind of has like a rhythmic delivery generally. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. It works. But, but here, here, here as well, and he's also got that kind of, occasionally he does this in Thin Lizzy songs where he puts on kind of a, a kind of fake American accent, mm -hmm. and sometimes it kind of works and he gets away with it. Here it's just, France, they gotta dance. Yeah, it's really obnoxious. But I mean, like that, like it's a weirdly common thing in like 60s and 70s rock. I mean, like the Rolling Stones put on the weirdest fake American accent. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and Elton John's fake American accent. Because it's Elton John, it's goofy and campy. He gets away with it pretty much 100% of the time anyway. Phil Liner, you know, like, he does it in Boys Are Back in Town and it works perfectly fine. And it's, it's subtle there. Um, and I think it's, I've read people complain about, there's like maybe two or three songs where Phil Liner just sings in an Irish accent and like he gets mocked for it. And you're like, that's his accent. Oh, really? <laughs> Literally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, he is so Irish. You ever see a, like a, an interview with him? And like, yeah, yeah. It's surprising how kind of strong his accent is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because he doesn't sing with it 99% yeah, yeah. of the time. But in the same way that the, there's a few songs where the Beatles sing in a Scouse accent, and it's very weird. <laughs> it's just like, <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, they're putting that on. It's like, well, they're not. That's actually their voice. Um, 
But yeah, so li- mel- melodically, the, the the vocals are doing nothing. But it does like that's fine. I can put up with that. But if you're gonna sing, sing, speak, talk, the wor- some of the worst lyrics. I mean. Have, is it something I think you've I feel like you've said this before about this song you said it feels like the kind of song which takes less time to write than it does to record it yes I think I did say that or it, it takes less time to write than the actual length of the song essentially yeah yeah yeah, yeah. And it, I just like it. almost like he's thinking a line ahead as he goes through mm-hmm. okay we've yeah. got we, we've got dance France rhymes with dance cool we've got a theme next Next verse, okay, we've got France. I'm going for Spain. What rhymes with Spain? Name. Get back to boogie dance. Mm-hmm. Another but, country, Brazil. Okay, Brazil, pill. Okay, cool, <laughs> quick boy. But it's quite amazing because like, he's clearly insisted upon getting the internal rhyme up within a line. Like in France, they've got a dance. That okay, right? Yeah, yeah. Really, that's really ham fisted. But then the first, the first verse rhymes. The, the end of, so the first two lines end with dance. Then it ends with ro- romance, and then dance again. So he's rhymed dance with itself three times. And then the second verse, name with name, then same, and then chance. There's, there's no rhyme scheme, but chance yeah, rhymes yeah. with dance, which brings you into the chorus. Like and then it's, Brazil... It's, it's, it's like that, that high-level um, <laughs> rhyme scheme where he's, he's rhyming the ends of uh, verses with each other. That's, that's high-level thinking. No, I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> so, it, I mean, it really is. I think, I remember when I bought this CD when I was like 15 or whatever. Um, I think I was disappointed at the overall album, but, you know, you hear it and you think, oh, that's a decent song, but it's just not very well recorded. Mm-hmm. You get to this song and it's just, it's one of those songs that just made me cringe. Even though I was just <laughs> listening to it on headphones and no one else could hear it. You kind of look around like, can people hear this? I don't want people to know that I'm listening to this <laughs> absolute shit. Um, and it's, I, it's one, of those songs, one of the first songs that I really remember just feeling like massively disappointed by. Not necessarily because you see the song title written now, you don't expect a lot. But when you're just like oh. disappointed by a band you really like and you're like, oh no. Do you know what I mean though? When you're just like, oh, like this didn't have to happen. You could have just not recorded this song. Yeah, yeah, that's... I, like especially, I don't know. Phil as he has some goofy songs, mm-hmm. but this one probably takes the cake. Mm-hmm. I yeah. think. Wh- which other ones do you think are a bit goofy then? Uh, well, like you know, I I do love it, but like the hero and the madman is very goofy. That's yeah, that's insane. But but it's just so different to actually everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah no, that's true. Like, it, it doesn't. It's just completely different to every other Phil Lizzy song. Whereas this one sounds like a Phil Lizzy song. That's just. Mm-hmm. Really goofy. Yeah, Hearing yeah. the Madman just doesn't sound like any other song I ever recorded, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah that um, is true. I think S and M is a bit weird as well. Yes, that's true. That's true. it's also that very goofy. True. That album, like, so that it's, 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 it was released on the Black Rose album a few uh, years after this. That whole album has a goofy vibe to it. We like tons of like cartoon sounding drums. Oh yeah, like, doom, doom, boom. Yes, yeah, yeah. And tons of wacky noises, and it's just really. So I think it's one of those things like I guess you could ask it of this like how serious are Thin Lizzy at times like sometimes it's quite hard to know to what degree they're self-aware of their goofiness yeah I mean they must just be fucking around here yeah yeah I mean obviously they're fucking around but yeah. <laughs> it's, it's weird isn't it because like fucking around and being goofy can really hit the mark sometimes yeah because there's not really there's not kind of enough content for it to be kind of funny in any other mm. way like yeah S and M is literally about S and M, and has like there's a lot of like that internal rhyme in that song where he's got like the really drawn out S not sounds. Yeah, yeah it no, sounds he's... all weird and dirty, and then there's like the weird whipping <laughs> noises at another bit, yeah. and then like the hero and the madman is just like a weird goofy story. Whereas this just it doesn't have the it doesn't have the it's just not got enough to it to be both this, goofy yeah, and yeah. satisfying. That's true. There's just nothing to it beyond. But some people seem to really like this song, by the way. I want to make that clear. Yeah, yeah. I, so this is, this is the thing that I always like to do when you find a really shit song is look it up on the internet and see. I guess, I don't know. It makes me realize just how many people there are in the world. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. And how long like my, they can be. But like my, my statistics brain, if you think of like, you know, 
the average taste of people who like music. And there are enough people that distribution goes out really wide in both directions. And yes, there are people yeah. who like the shittest songs you could ever imagine. But yeah, there's, you know, tens of thousands of views of these videos mm -hmm. on YouTube and a lot mm -hmm. of different copies actually, you know, mm -hmm. different people uploading it. You know, sometimes you get a song that's just shit and only one person uploads it because why would anyone upload it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, and you have comments of people being like, oh, unless you never recorded a bad song. So yeah, you, no, you're, I was going to say. You're commenting that... on the song that is the worst song. <laughs> I was going to say, I've said people, sorry, I've seen people say that on like Twitter, whatever, like Thin Lizzy never had a single bad song. And I'm just like, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> yeah. like, I love them. I like them a lot. But I'm not even sure if I, if, if I could say they had a single great album because there's always one song where you're like left scratching your head, like, what is this? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like what? You, this was not needed. Like even Jailbreak has, and it's actually not a bad song, but it has a terrible chorus. Oh, poor Romeo, sitting on, on his Romeo. <laughs> and again, I'm sat there thinking, like, how self-aware is this? It feels quite like I don't know whether to read it mockingly, like, oh, like oh, like in a patronizing, oh, poor Romeo, yeah, yeah. or whether he was just like, I'm gonna have to rhyme Romeo with Onio. I'm just that's what I'm gonna have to do, and it can't work out. Um, and Black Rose, I think, has With Love is not a bad song, but it's boring. You probably won't even remember it. No, I, I remember With Love. Oh, what else is on that one? The one that's like the jolliest breakup song ever. What's that one? Um, oh. Uh, you quit, I win, you lose. Or yeah, 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 yeah. Get out of here. That's what it's called. Get out of here. I've had enough. That's it. Quit. Give up. You win. I lose. You win. You choose. You stay. I'll go. You stay. I lose. I used to be a dreamer, but I realize that it's not my style. I think that's fine. That's better than that one's love. okay. That one kind of yeah, works. Yeah. I think that's like kind of a jolly, goofy power rock song in a way, like power yeah. pop. Do you know what I mean? Or um, do anything you want to do is definitely on the goofy side. Maybe it's oh, not yeah. awful. But I think I think that's where he like he succeeds in being goofy. Yes, but then he also does like a weird Elvis impression at the end for no for no reason whatsoever. Yeah, which is no like, discernible Elvis reason. <laughs> so I, I'm sure I've read that Scott Gorham's just like yeah, he just want he just he just liked his Elvis impersonation. He thought he was really good. <laughs> <laughs> so which also just... like I guess now you just think you know that's just an Elvis impression, right? But I guess at the time Elvis had just died. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So is, is that like a a tribute to him? I don't really... Oh, oh he does it. The king of rock and roll is dead. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, yeah. he is specifically drawing attention to that part of it. Um, I think, I, yeah, I mean, he was a massive Elvis fan. Um, I, I think, yeah, Scott Gorham is probably right. I mean, he knew him, so he's like, yeah, he just really liked his impression of Elvis. So <laughs> he, just want, he just insisted we put it on the end of the record, because it doesn't fit with the song whatsoever. Excellent. <laughs> But I mean, that's a, that's a cool song. So like, right, those are some good examples of goofy songs that work. Mm -hmm. But this one, I, this is a real head scratcher. I'm still, because I've read Brian Robertson, has, the, uh, the uh, guitarist on this album, one of the guitarists on this album, he insists that they had like lots of good material other than this. He was like, oh yeah, we, we, we have plenty of other songs that we could have done. So I like, guess, like specifically in reference to Boogie Woogie Dance. No, no, no. He said, like, oh, there was another eight or nine really good songs that we could have put on the album. Now, I, I don't see, know okay, how yeah. true that is or whether he just like had a cool riff. Do you know what I mean? I'm not. Mm -hmm. It could be nonsense. But if that is true, it just what the hell is this song doing here? Like, I just it's complete head scratcher. There's no other way to put it, because. I mean, I know he was ill with hepatitis whilst writing most of these songs. But this song is so obviously incredibly weak. It, like, it's so obviously shit. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, well, I feel like there are plenty of, like, songs that you can probably, you know, find on, like, a deluxe edition of one of their other albums before this, where they mm. just didn't put it on an album. Yeah, yeah. It's like, just take one of those. But I, yeah. I guess, yeah, yeah, you that... know, the, the great artists always leave the next generation with puzzles to solve and boogie woogie dance is just another one of those yeah, yeah so we're going to solve this puzzle and we're going to finally say this is this is this is our comprehensive definitive statement on this song and yes. everyone else I know, who, the world has been waiting 
The world has been waiting for this moment. Bated breath. <laughs> is this song cringe or cute? I guess it's almost a, a completely wrong category, but like cool or cringe, we might, we might call it. Definitely, definitely cringe. Definitely cringe. I totally agree. I mean, it's so safely in the cringe category. Mm-hmm. But... And I really want to draw a distinction between this and the last song I did on a, on a, a similar episode, which was on horseback. Because I can listen to that, and sometimes I'm just like, oof, cringe. And other times I listen to On Horseback, and I think, this is really quite sweet, and it's nice, and mm. I, I get something out of it. I've never thought anything positive about this song, beyond like the instrumental bits. I, like The general impression has never been anything other than a physical cringe, a kind of, I would not, I would not listen to this song out loud. Even, do you know what I mean? It, it's that cringe. Yeah, yeah. you, you don't want to be associated with it. And I'm sorry to all those YouTube commenters who... <laughs> 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 genuinely seem to like this song. Yeah, th- th- there was one that I saw of someone basically saying, like, I used to think this song was filler until I listened to it loads and loads over the years. Now I think it's, you know, genuinely a really good song. No, you don't. You're a liar. <laughs> until I listened to it loads and loads. I think that the song may have just damaged your brain, if that's how you, <laughs> if that's how you got to the point of liking it. Um, that's probably true. But yeah, I, I feel like this this song probably goes against your whole ethos of this podcast of yes overrated and underhated this is it's probably underhated not enough people know about this song yeah it's yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. song silly uh, fans need to learn about this song and they need to hate it mm-hmm. i do i do totally agree it does partly go against the ethos of my podcast but it's also just funny to talk about these terrible songs <laughs> or as some future episodes will be songs that are a bit weird and a, you know more like the the, the the Mike Oldfield song, but this is firmly cringe. I'm glad yeah, we I think agree. So. I think there's, um, there's, there's even there's a part of me that actually uh, feels bad for coming onto this podcast about this. I, I think it, its existence should probably be wiped from from human memory. Yeah, but, yeah, uh, yeah. But you're keeping I it going, so thanks. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I feel like we should draw people's attention to it. Um, but yeah. I think that's a good place for us to wrap up. Nice short episode to talk about one of the worst songs by by a band that is actually criminally underrated, I think. Um, But it's a terrible song. It's nonetheless a terrible song. Um, And in conclusion, um, I'm just going to say, before we say goodbye, that anyone who's listening, if you listen to me on Spotify, find my YouTube page, Big Yellow Praxis, give it a like and a subscribe. And yeah, thanks for listening. Thanks for coming, Zach. Bye. See ya.